Hi everyone, this is Doc Ina, and the topic for today is on operative vaginal delivery. Our main reference is Williams Obstetrics, 24th edition, chapter 29, Operative Vaginal Delivery. This is the outline of our lecture. Operative deliveries are vaginal deliveries accomplished with the use of a vacuum device or forceps. Once either is applied to the fetal head, outward traction generates forces that augment maternal pushing to deliver the fetus vaginally. The most important function of both devices is traction. In addition, however, forceps may also be used for rotation, particularly from occiput transvers and posterior positions. Operative vaginal delivery generally is performed from either a low or outlet station. And the goal for operative vaginal delivery is to shorten the second stage of labor. Some fetal indications for operative vaginal delivery include non-reassuring fetal heart rate pattern and premature placental separation. In the past, forceps delivery was believed to be somewhat protective of the fragile preterm infant head. Subsequent studies, however, reported no significant differences in outcomes for neonates who weighed 500 to 1,500 grams between those delivered spontaneously and those delivered by outlet forceps. Some maternal indications include heart disease, pulmonary injury or compromise, intrapartum infection, and certain neurologic conditions. The most common are exhaustion and prolonged second stage of labor. Operative vaginal delivery should generally be performed from either a low or outlet station. Additionally, forceps or vacuum delivery generally should not be used electively until the criteria for an outlet delivery have been met. In these circumstances, operative vaginal delivery is a simple and safe operation although with some risk of maternal lower reproductive tract injury. Moreover, there is no evidence that use of prophylactic pr operative delivery is beneficial in the otherwise normal delivery. So this is the mnemonic that we use to help us remember the prerequisites for operative vaginal delivery. So we have forcep, F for fully dilated cervix, O for experienced operator, R ruptured membranes, C, cephalic presentation, and this is applicable for the vacuum device, S another C for cephalopelvic disproportion that is ruled out, E, engaged fetal present presenting part, and P, position of the fetal head should be correctly assessed. Again, when we say operative vaginal delivery, we mean either forceps or a vacuum device. This is the classification of forceps delivery. Basically, we have three because the high forceps is not really included in classification. Outlet forceps, the criteria for this is that the scalp is visible at the introitus without separating the labia. The fetal skull has reached the pelvic floor. Fetal head is at or on the perineum. Sagittal suture is in AP diameter or right or left occiput anterior or posterior position and rotation does not exceed 45 degrees. For low forceps, the criteria are the leading point of the fetal skull is at station plus 2 and not on the pelvic floor and rotation is 45 degrees or less or rotation is greater than 45 degrees. For a mid forceps, the criterion is the station is between 0 and plus 2. For forceps delivery, the two most important discriminators of risk for both mother and infant are station and rotation. Forceps deliveries are categorized as outlet, low, and mid pelvic procedures. And as I've said, high forceps have no place in contemporary obstetrics. In general, a higher station or greater degrees of rotation equals higher chances of maternal or fetal injury. So the basic functions of forceps are traction and rotation. 
For traction, the direction of traction should be along the direction of the pelvic curvature. The direction of the pull should be perpendicular to the plane of the level at which it is being applied. The higher the level is, the more posterior the direction of traction. For rotation, this is best carried out in the mid-pelvis. Handles should be swung through a wide arc in order to reduce the arc of the blades. This makes the procedure easier and lowers the incidence and extent of vaginal lacerations. In general, a higher station or greater degree of rotation increases the chance of maternal or fetal injury. So what are the maternal morbidities expected from a wrong use of forceps? First is lacerations. There are higher rates of 3rd and 4th degree vaginal laceration and cervical laceration in an improperly placed forceps. In an effort to lower rates of lacerations, many advocate only indicated episiotomy with operative vaginal delivery. For pelvic floor disorders, possible risk for urinary incontinence, anal incontinence, and pelvic organ prolapse. Proposed mechanisms for pelvic floor disorders include structural compromise or pelvic floor denervation secondary to forces exerted during delivery. Urinary retention and bladder dysfunction are common short-term effects. For the perinatal morbidity, we have acute perinatal injuries such as cephalhematoma, subgaleal hemorrhage, corneal abrasions, retinal hemorrhage, neonatal jaundice secondary to these hemorrhages, facial nerve injury, brachial plexus injury, shoulder dystocia, clavicular fracture, and scalp lacerations. There is no evidence that children born through forceps delivery perform poorly than those delivered spontaneously or via cesarean section. What is a trial of operative vaginal delivery? If an attempt to perform an operative vaginal delivery is expected to be difficult, then it should be considered a trial. Delivery is conducted preferably in an operating room equipped and staffed for immediate cesarean delivery just in case the operative vaginal delivery fails. If forceps cannot be satisfactorily applied, then the procedure is stopped and either vacuum extraction or cesarean delivery is performed. If there is no descent with traction using vacuum, the trial should be abandoned and cesarean delivery is performed. On the other hand, sequential instrumentation is the term we use involving an attempt at the vacuum extraction followed by one with forceps. This most likely stems from the higher completion rate with forceps compared with vacuum extraction. For the forceps design, this instrument consists basically of two crossing branches. Each branch has four components, namely the blade, shank, lock, and handle. The blades have two sides, the cephalic curve and the pelvic curve. Blades may have different designs. They may be solid, fenestrated, or pseudo-fenestrated. And it has basically two kinds of locks, or, or what we call articulation. It can be the English lock or the sliding lock. Tucker McLean forceps. The blade is solid and the shank is narrow. This is often used for fetus with a rounded head, which is more characteristic in multiparas. The Elliot forceps has an ample pelvic curve in the blades. The fenestrated blade and the overlapping shank in front of the English style lock characterize these forceps. The Simpsons forceps is uh, designed very similar to Elliot. It also has an ample pelvic curve, fenestrated blades, and parallel shanks. The Elliot and Simpsons forceps permit a firmer grasp of the fetal head because of their fenestrated blades, but at the expense of increased blade thickness, which may increase vaginal trauma. In general, Simpsons or Elliot forceps are used to deliver a fetus with a molded head, as is common in nulliparous women. The Keelan forceps has minimal pelvic curvature, a sliding lock, and a very light weight. These are some of the other forceps designs that are available. So how do we apply the forceps blade? And how do we deliver the baby using a forceps? First, the left handle of the forceps is held in the left hand. 
two or more fingers of the right hand are inserted into the vagina beside the fetal head, as seen in this picture. The blade is introduced into the left side of the pelvis between the fetal head and the fingers of the operator's right hand. So as you can see in this picture, you note the arc of the handle as it rotates to be applied to the mother's left side. So that, at the end of the rotation, the branch of the forceps is parallel to the floor. Have an assistant's hand hold this handle in place as the second blade or the right blade is applied. So for application of the right blade, two or more fingers of the left hand are introduced into the right posterior portion of the vagina to serve as a guide for the right blade. This blade is held in the right hand and introduced into the vagina as described for the left blade. After positioning, the branches are articulated. Now if the head is positioned in the left occiput anterior or right occiput anterior position, then the lower of the two blades is typically placed first. If the two branches do not easily lock into place, please do not force it. Just remove the forceps one by one, reassess the fetal head position, and reapply. Inability to lock the forceps properly is a major clue that the forceps blade are applied incorrectly. The solution, remove the forceps, reassess the fetal head, then reapply the forceps only when the prerequisites are adequately fulfilled. The blades are constructed so that their cephalic curve is closely adapted to the sides of the fetal head. The biparietal diameter of the fetal head corresponds to the greatest distance between the appropriately applied blades. Consequently, the fetal head is perfectly grasped only when the long axis of the blades corresponds to the occipitomental diameter. So this picture shows us a perfectly placed forceps that is symmetrically placed and articulated. For the an occiput anterior position, appropriately applied blades are equidistant from the sagittal suture and each blade is equidistant from its adjacent lambdoidal suture. In the occiput posterior position, the blades are equidistant from the midline of the face and the brow. So after correct placement of the blades, traction should be intermittent and the head should be allowed to recede between contractions as in spontaneous labor. Except when urgently indicated as in severe fetal bradycardia, delivery should be sufficiently slow, deliberate, and gentle to prevent undue head compression. It is preferable to apply traction only with each uterine contraction. Maternal pushing will augment these efforts. So after the vulva has been well distended by the head, the delivery may be completed in several ways. Some clinicians keep the forceps in place to control the advance of the head. If done, however, the thickness of the blades adds to vulvar distension, thus increasing the likelihood of laceration or necessitating a large episiotomy. To prevent this, the forceps may be removed and delivery is then completed by maternal pushing. Importantly, if blades are disarticulated and removed too early, the head may recede and lead to a prolonged delivery. Pushing in some cases may be aided by addition of the modified Ritgen maneuver. We can also use forceps to deliver a face presentation, but only in a mentum anterior face presentation. The blades are applied to the sides of the head along the occipitomental diameter. Downward traction is exerted until the chin appears under the symphysis. By an upward movement, the face is slowly extracted, followed by the occiput. Remember, forceps should not be applied to the mentum posterior face presentation because vaginal delivery is impossible except in very small fetuses. As for rotation from occiput transverse positions, when the occiput is directed towards the patient's left, rotation counterclockwise from the left side toward the midline is required. For occiput or right occiput transverse position, clockwise rotation is required. So the second operative vaginal delivery is vacuum extraction. Suction is created within a cup placed on the fetal scalp such that traction on the cup aids fetal expulsion. 
In the United States of America, they call this vacuum extractor, whereas in Europe, they call this the wind tube. There are theoretical advantages of vacu vacuum extraction over forceps, and these are simpler requirements for precise positioning on the fetal head and avoidance of space-occupying blades within the vagina, thereby lowering the maternal trauma rates. Remember, vacuum extraction is used only for traction. It can never be used to rotate the fetal head. This is in contrast to the forceps, which is used for traction and rotation. And vacuum extraction cannot be used for fetuses with face presentation. These are the two types of vacuum cups, the rigid cup and the soft cup. The rigid cup is a firm, flattened, mushroom-shaped cup with a circular ridge around the cup rim. It generates significantly more traction force and it is, and it is preferred for occiput posterior transverse presentation or for asyncletism. The disadvantage is that there's higher scalp laceration rates and cephal hematoma. For a soft cup, this is a pliable funnel or a bell-shaped dome. This is preferred for occiput anterior deliveries. It has lower incidence of scalp injury. These are the examples of a soft cup and a rigid cup. Letter A is the rigid cup, it's flat, whereas letter B is the soft cup. An important step in vacuum extraction is proper cup placement over the flexion point. This is a pivot point that maximizes traction, minimizes cup detachment and flexes but averts twisting of the fetal head and delivers the smallest head diameter through the pelvic outlet. This improves success rates, lowers fetal scalp injury rates, and lessens perineal trauma because of the smallest fetal head diameter that distends the vulva. So this drawing demonstrates the correct cup placement at the flexion point. Along the sagittal suture, this spot lies about 3 cm from the posterior fontanelle and 6 cm from the anterior fontanelle. The edge of the cup is around 3 cm from the anterior fontanelle. Placement of the cup more anteriorly on the fetal cranium or near the anterior fontanelle should be avoided because this leads to cervical spine extension during traction unless the fetus is small. It also delivers a wider fetal head diameter through the vaginal opening, and asymmetrical placement relative to the sagittal suture may worsen asyncletism. The entire cup circumference should be palpated before, both before and after the vacuum has been created, as well as prior to traction to exclude maternal tissue entrapment. Gradual vacuum creation is generated by increasing the suction in increments of 0.2 kg per cm2 every 2 minutes, until a total negative pressure of 0.8 kg per cm2 is reached. Similar to forceps delivery, traction is usually directed initially downward, then progressively extended upward as the head emerges. Manual torque to the cup is avoided as it may cause cup displacement or cephal hematoma and with metal cups, cookie cutter type scalp lacerations. During pulls, the operator should place the non-dominant hand within the vagina, with the thumb on the extractor cup and one or more fingers on the fetal scalp. This is to judge the descent and prevent cup pop-offs. As a general guideline, progressive descent should accompany each traction attempt. That's it for this lecture. Thank you for watching and please don't forget to subscribe to my channels. Thank you.